presentations first. Uh, my name is Mark. I've been into this for 16 years, uh, which is a long time. I started studying modern scene rights and stuff like that. I'm one of the founding members of uh, the Mass, um, one of the first guys in the studio, and I apologize for that. Sorry. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm really not part of the leading, uh, I'm a part of the DevOps engineering team at Rackspace. And uh, we do pre sales, we uh, encourage companies to embrace DevOps, and we especially try to explain what DevOps is about. And I've been doing DevOps for five years now. Been introducing it when I arrived in London by my uh, first CTO that was very much into it. If you want to hear his thoughts of wisdom, he has a Twitter account that we created for him called Shift My City Essays. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend it. <laughs> so, Rightspace. Uh, Rightspace, uh, as you know, was founded in 98, just in case you didn't know, in San Antonio, Texas. It's the home of fanatical support, so we do everything fanatically uh, in one way or another. Um, we are the second biggest cloud provider in the world after Amazon. Uh, the far second, but still second, so that counts. Um, uh, we co founded OpenStack with NASA, which is a very cool thing. So, microservices, uh, hard to go into. When somebody asks me about microservices, this is the first thing that comes to my mind. I'm slightly childish, I know, but good memories about that. So, the first thing is that microservices are not new. They are they are a faith, they are the cool thing to say now, like DevOps or Cloud was a year ago, but they are not a new thing. It has been implemented many, many times. So who doesn't remember here Yahoo Pipes, which was kind of a microservice implementation that was slightly wrong. So the other thing about microservices as well is that, like in nature, it tries to get more robust by having big numbers, so you can kill one of the members and that doesn't kill the flock in a certain way. So microservices are quite reliant, which is uh, good for your service. And the last one, like in this 18-wheeler. So does somebody here know what an 18-wheeler, why it does half 18 wheels? Just not because they want to, they're sponsored by the entire industry or anything like that. It's done like that because it's designed for failure. So if one of the guys are done, it's still running. So microservices is one of the good things that they force you to decide for failure because you're interacting with all these different services and it's very important that they talk to each other and if they can't talk, you, you have a remediation for that. And that's forced a lot into this chart. So uh, I'm sure you've, you've seen this before, uh, the fragile, anti-fragile brothers chart where you can pretty much put any kind of application there and uh, DevOps um, is trying to go to the anti-fragile pattern so it's a pattern that it doesn't avoid failure, it embraces failure and tries to fail gracefully. So recommendations, as any expert like Stig um, could recommend you. So the kind of recommendations I have about using microservices, I've implemented them in the past in more or less successful degrees. So the first one, and this is up for debate of course, is to use one server per service. So when you do microservice, the best thing is that you can isolate the problem, you can isolate the failure, you can deploy it anytime you want. But if that server is shared with all the services, you start to have some trouble, some complexity added to that, which defeats the purpose of having microservices in a certain way in production. These are also good work for containers, which, I'm oh sorry, that's the other one. So the, the next one would be to do your HA right. So as you know, microservices have routers, have message queues. So it's important that you have at least one something listening on the other side. And if that something is not listening on the other side, then clearly you have failure. Uh, there's some tricks to do that. You can have two of them, uh, which complicates things slightly, but still OK. Or you can do uh, the cheating way of creating an scanning group of one member. And then when that member dies, it comes up again. So cheeky, but it works. And a set containers. There you go. So the other thing that you can use microservices with is containers. And why containers? Because containers are cool now. They have a cool logo that goes with it. Uh, they run on Linux LXC, which after version 1.0 they didn't recommend for production. I think they do recommend it for production now, but not certain. So uh, your mileage may vary. We use 
Docker, our microservices of Rackspace, we have one product called Mayran. Um, we run that in production using Docker when the Docker guys were saying, you shouldn't be using this in production, but hey, if you're a reckless guy, go ahead, uh, no responsible values. And it actually works fairly well. Um, as you know, the, one of the advantages of containers is that it removes all that overhead of the hardware virtualization and you can just run your apps, use 100% of your server, and try to maximize the output. And the last one, which is interesting, API versioning. API versioning will really help you with microservices. As you know, modifying APIs once you publish them is incredibly painful, and sometimes even difficult. You have lots of things that are talking to one another with the implementation of the API that they know. So you want to make certain that they still talk and they still work properly. So I actually got this from OpenStack. You can see for getting a list of servers, the way to call the API has changed over time. And the first one just was just last service, but then the project started versioning there. So you could add or remove features or change the way it worked without interrupting any services. The only bad thing then, of course, is that you have several versions of the same API. So it's an effort, a kind of technical depth kind of thing that you need to move all your applications to the new API version. But you have some time, you have that window that you can use to migrate them. And then also, when you design your microservices and you deploy them, it's very important to think about synchronous against the synchronous, uh, which, as you know, it's very important for the user experience. So one of the things I always ask about services is, if you run the service in a serial way, so you have first action, then second, then third, does this second action will actually benefit the interaction of the user? If the answer is no, then what you can actually do is to put that action for later and let the user go through your web page or go through your transaction as fast as possible. And this would be good for example, clever example, to send emails to the user saying that you just did this for them or that the product is available. You don't need to do that while the user is browsing the web page, you can do that in another machine. So, and these are the tools that you can use for that. Uh, for microservices, as you know, you have routers or load balancers that you can send to your API endpoints. And then you have schedulers that feed them queues that then are pulled by workers to do the jobs that you want them to do. So it's a very good distinction between synchronous and asynchronous, which works very well. But of course, as anything, there's a dark side of microservices, the things that you should have in mind and that you shouldn't do if you can. <coughs> So the first one, and this is a very important one, right, is, is about cost. So when you design your microservices, you need to tailor your platform around them. So what are you running? Are you running physical servers? Are you running uh, VMware? Are you running on a public cloud? And if so, what is the cost, the overhead of having every single server in that platform? And that will help you design your microservices deployment around those costs because what you want to do is that the overhead of the microservices be as low as possible to the cost. The next one, which relates to the first one, is concentration. You, as you have microservices and you go, oh yeah, this one doesn't have too much higher, or this one over there doesn't have too much network bandwidth utilization. So I can actually put two of, two of them together in the same machine, running <coughs> Docker, running LX itself, the containers of a certain way, because that way you are isolating the container and you're doing all the right things. But then, at the end of the way, the real point of failure is that single machine, is that single thing running all your containers. Um, you can even go inside and more crazy about that, and you can even say, every single server that you have on the same rack is a danger. So then you start to be rack aware, so when you start deploying services, you deploy one on one rack, one on the next rack, etc. And that's kind of like what Google does. So Google has a certain tolerance for machines, and machines die in the rack and they don't care, they keep running. And when they reach a certain number, they offline the whole rack, and then they send someone to pull the rack out and try to start repairing machines. And that's the most cost-efficient way to do that. So when your microservices start growing and your applications start growing, you, start, you need to make certain that you disseminate the, the risk across all these uh, different hardware. And the last one, and this is the main one about uh, microservices, is network fragmentation. So who here uses uh, Amazon AWS? So raise your hands. 
So Q here that uses Amazon AWS didn't have any single network disconnection or network problem. Anyone? No? <laughs> so there you go. And that happens with everything. So Amazon is famous for that, and the, the network fragmentation in Amazon is as creative as the network fragmentation on IRC. Um, but, but still, it's, it's a thing that you need to design for. You need to be aware of it. You need to be clever about it. Um, that's pretty much it. So any questions that you may have? So you don't have that control because you're sharing that infrastructure with other people as any public cloud. You are sacrificed, you are, I would say, you're being charged less in order to get more out of this, the hardware that we run. And that happens with any public cloud provider, that Amazon, Rackspace, uh, whichever you want. The thing to have in mind there is that there's several algorithms that you can use for that. Um, I know that we use one to avoid having two VMs from the same user in the same server because we want to try to avoid that, right? So if the server goes bad for any reason, and we feel very bad when that happens, but it's life, we try to minimize the impact on the user. And the impact is like, hey, why don't your servers die? But all the other 10 are fine. Um, that's what we try to do. We, we run algorithms that are rack aware, so they try to disseminate across racks as well, because that happens as well. When rack suddenly has a small fire and you, have to, you need to shut down the full rack, which never happened to us, but hey, it could happen. So uh, it's very important uh, for us that kind of, this kind of algorithm to work properly to be able to disseminate risk for you as well. But in reality, you have to trust us when we say that to you. So that could not be the, the truth, which in this case it is, I swear. <laughs> but, uh, that could be in another way in other providers. I know Amazon is using that as well in a certain way. Uh, but considering that we said network fragmentation is fun with them, then I don't know how they go around the algorithm. Thank <laughs> you.